Okay, so here we are at the High Plains No-Till Conference. I'm going to walk in here and talk with Zach about our compost and see how it looks under a microscope. Okay, to give you some background, Zach is the one that helped me fix my compost when it went anaerobic. So he's the one I called uh, after some of the advice that John gave me, we weren't getting it fixed. Okay, so bear with this video because the audio quality isn't the best because I don't have all my equipment because the battery went dead on some of it. But this is going to be a video that you want to watch because there's going to be an honest look at some of the negative aspects of doing compost the way I do it, um, but there's also going to be a, you know, some of the pros of doing it the way we do it, and so you're you're going to like seeing, you know, a negative view of this because it's it's just honest, it's raw. Like I I don't like being fake, and I don't like not including my mistakes because you need to know that you can make mistakes, and that it's going to be okay, and that you can, um, you know, fight through, learn, and uh, adapt yourselves. So this is going to be a good video for you to be able to see. Uh, a close-up look of what our compost looks like under a microscope. So this one's our, our grass uh, compost. It's made just from straight gra grass clippings. Judging by the color, how it's kind of a pilsnery yellow, I wouldn't, I, I just, again, I would think that this material just needs more time. To Something. But it's not overly bacterial. You've got a nice bacillus, longer rod of bacteria right here. Obviously, you've got a lot of cocci, these dots here. You've got a shorter bacillus rod here. Shape does indicate diversity. You know, not species diversity, but diversity just in bacteria in general. We want to always see that. That's a uh, that's a plant part, as you can see, it's still very clear, it's not parallel by any means, so this is just, that's, basically if I had to guess it's probably cellulose, plant cellulose. You don't see anything bumbling around in the protozoa world yet. Here's some, some humus formation right there, you can see on the surface here when we roll through all the layers. Yeah, got some fungal spores in there, which is good. There. So that's. I don't know what that is. That might be a testate amoeba, actually. Just like the snails of the soil. It's a good protozoa. That's a testate amoeba right there. It's good. We want to see that. Whatever it is, Crawls out of. Okay, there's a fungal yeah. spore actually. Right so, but here. And then that's fungi coming out of it. There's fungal hypho right there. Eleven out of ten dentists recommend. We went ahead and cut the volume out because it, at this point it was just so loud. So I asked Zach, for a Johnson Sue compost that is 10 months old, should we be seeing more fungus? And he said yes. And the reason we're not is a large function of it going anaerobic. Um, even though it fixed itself, it's no longer anaerobic. The ending result was a higher bacteria dominant compost rather than a fungally dominant compost, but still compost that we can use to stimulate the seed in our soil for what we're doing in our farming operation. Okay, just because of background noise, I'm going to voice over on this again. So Zach's pointing out that in this compost from uh, 2020, it was better in better condition. It has more humus, uh, more aggregates uh, within the, the slide, and uh, more bacteria, more fungus. Um, but he was surprised that, you know, it had been two years of this breaking down. Um, he said that it doesn't look like compost has been breaking down for two years. So again, I think that's a, a function of this going anaerobic over the summer of 2020. So he points out on this one that if he did a humus analysis, uh, this one would definitely have a uh, higher humus in it. 
at this point, uh, Zach spots a nematode there in the center. So he kind of zooms in. He explains uh, how he knows that that's a uh, beneficial nematode that's eating bacteria. And um, from the previous sl uh, compost, he had found a uh, nematode in that one as well. And he said they look like the same species of nematode. Good. More bacteria. Look at the density of this compared to that last sample. And you've got that fungal hypha right there. Lots of testate amoeba. One, two, three. So to me, if you were to say, which one should I use? I would say, well, both but I would definitely want to use this up. The beginning of the First. planting season? Yeah. yeah. Fungal spore, fungal spore. Uh, that might even be a fungal spore right there too. Fungal spore. So Zach, let's say I have compost and I, I don't know that I have enough to cover every acre and all, all my seed. You think I'm better off buying a product like uh, the Bio 5 stuff and treating my seed with that and using this in furrow? Or how would you go about that, do you think? As a I would say you should use this stuff in furrow versus on your seed. Mm -hmm. um, I would say keeping it and keeping it liquid, applying it as a liquid directly to your soil would be a better benefit because of the concentration of organisms that are in this. There's a high concentration of bacteria in here. Um, I think for seed coating, I think more mature, almost dried out compost that's just high in humus is the better fit for a seed coating. You know, where you took that dry material and you classified it into like a really fine powder, mm -hmm. almost like graphite. Yeah. That would be a better material than this. This is, a, I'd want to keep this somewhat fresh. I really wouldn't want this material to dry out. Get some nice humus, you know, building here for sure. But for two years old, I would have expected less of this material. See all this sure. pale material that's kind of yeah. has shape. Well, and I, I think it. that was probably because of the anaerobic conditions from the summer of 20. Right. Uh, okay. 20. So it's, to me, it's got a ways to go for decompositionally. I think it could break down a lot. I think if you incorporated a, a different culture that had, you know, a high, there's some active fungal hypha. It's a nice chunk right there. I think if you had something with more, definitely more fungi and more protozoa, that you could put into there, they could reduce these bacterial populations, which in turn would start help breaking this down faster sure. and gluing it together and making it more. See, look at that, that's raw, yeah. that material. And this is what I, I feel like is holding so much of our no-till aspirations back because we've got a soil full of this kind of thing that can't turn into, well, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. There's a thread of fungal hyphen right there. Beneficial. It's good. So for two years, this to me isn't as decomposed as I would expect of material to be after two years. Yeah, I mean, at all. So decomposition slowed way down for you at some point. Maybe that was when you were anaerobic and it's yeah. never really recovered. That's a big amoeba right there. So it's this this compost that's only four months old, it's got actually has more yeah. fungus in it than those other ones that were ten months I mean, and, hands down, and two. This. Okay. Ten year old computer, ten year old microscope. A little bit. So that's fungal hyphae right there. Oh, we're still at it, yeah. Look at that. One solid piece huh. alone. But I'm seeing it everywhere on this one. Yep. It's by far the most fungal of all of your samples. Get back to it. Still high bacteria. This is definitely bacterially dominated, dominating compost. Just. You can see that thread right there at the lowest magnification. It's so big. 
Okay, say so that last part again, Zach. I take a handful of this compost and put it in water. Because it's the it most fungally dominant one. Oh, hands down. And I'd water your other composts with it. I'd do that right away. The sooner the better. Because you do not have anywhere near this in your other piles. And now, let's go a little deeper. So I got like an old fashioned water. I'd get it good and in suspension and then into a slurry. Maybe use a paint stirrer and a drill. But even your bacterial populations are so much lower than the other stuff. So that to me tells me that the, there was just uh, more of a food, balanced yeah. ration of what right. you built this, this pile out of. A chunk of things humifying. There's a fungal spore. Fungal spore. So in a, in a Johnson Sioux, is it more important to have broken down or, or chip, finer chipped up wood chips than it is with the thermal composting? No, I wouldn't say at all. I'd say the size of the chips, you know, you want to have them at least an inch, I guess, in size. Um, no, I wouldn't go any smaller than that, or at least, you know, have at least a part that's that coarse, and you could do some wood shavings, you could do some leaves for your brown material. All right. Okay, so um, I just asked Zach about, um, oh, the, the Johnson Sioux method, and doing a pure form goes through the bath but what we've done is is taking it through a feed truck skip the bath method so what are the why why is david johnson want you to take it through a complete bath and why would you say that it that's not always necessarily beneficial in composting well no i i, I don't want to go against what dr david johnson's saying at all i think the reason why he's encouraged the minerals to be washed off his material to be Johnson Sioux composted is to rinse the mineral component off. Sure. Um, and he's trying to culture a pure organic matter with a pure organic matter medium, growth medium, or composting medium. And my own composting, I guess, that I help instruct people to do which is an aerobic thermal method, largely, I encourage that mineral component because to me it's a mineral food resource. Um, so yeah, up to 10% of the pile, one could put minerals into it. So oftentimes I'll encourage, you know, 10% of our total compost pile ration to be solely our field soils and composts, previous composts. And there's obviously minerals loaded in that material right there. So um, I'm not saying anybody's right or wrong. I, I just, to me personally, um, I'm seeing great, you know, biological diversity across the board always with kind of this aerobic thermal pile method that I teach people how to do specifically. And to me, and the way I teach it, minerals are a part of it. I wouldn't go more than 10%. But, um, you know, there's a lot of surface area on just clays, for example. And so mixing clays in with your material, like if you were to dust all your organic material with more clay, you would just have way more cation exchange capacity, more binding sites, uh, which to me acts as sort of like a magnetic glue just to help our material break down and aggregate and build. Um, yeah. So, Zach, for my viewers... Uh, tell them about what your company is called and what you specifically do. So, uh, I am pretty much the sole proprietor of the Living Soil Compost Lab. We've been at this since 2013. Um, what it is is largely a network, so I've really instructed and taught a lot of people how to compost and how to um, so cultivate their own microbiology, as well as use a microscope. Um, in very practical terms from farmers that want to do it so they can understand their own system 
um, to people that want to replicate and do kind of what I do, which is qualitatively analyze, analyze people's compost. So largely, I'm an educator. That's my background. Um, I do wear several hats in agriculture. Uh, kind of like as an unconventional agronomist. So I do test people's soils and compost for them. Um, I like to look at the unseen, so I look at some kind of fringy, unconventional things like humus. I test for humus, I test for paramagnetism, um, and then I obviously look at the ecosystem of people's soils as well um, to help interpret what the heck they're even growing in or growing with. So make dirt, humus again. It's kind of been my latest motto, but waste is food. That's really the name of the game. Everything is waste. Everything is creating waste at all times, from us to the very smallest things in the food chain, which are bacteria. Um, why not turn that into food? This has been great, Zach. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Jay. Yep. Okay, guys. Uh, closing thoughts from my conversation earlier this week with Zach. If you need a really fungally dominant compost, um, it looks like you need to go through the, the full Johnson Sue method. Um, even though that last one we did uh, was more fungally dominant than the others, it still had a higher uh, bacteria to fungus ratio um, than one to one, and you want a more fungally dominant compost uh, if you're doing a Johnson Sue for gardening. But if you're in our situation and you use it for, you know, larger scale farming, um, then I I'm seeing that you don't really need to take it through a bath. Um, you just need to make sure that you get the plenty of wood chips in there uh, to keep the fungus component going and to keep air going through your compost. So we're going to keep going with the feed truck. Um, but like I said, if you're needing a compost that is more fungally dominant and you don't want to take risks, uh, doing it our way and you have time to do it the johnson sue way the full method taking it through the bath then do that anyway i hope you enjoyed the video today peace out